Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this first session of this EXA conference on citizen science and the sustainable development goals. My name is Fanny Gutsche, and I work at the Citizen Science Center in Zurich, and I'm chairing this session. In the session, we're going to talk about, as the name says, the involvement of citizen science in the sustainable development goals and how this can all be better done and highlighted by um, thinking a bit more about the local nature of citizen science. A short uh, break up of the session, we will start with two presentations and they're each followed by a Q&A to the speaker. And then in the last half an hour, we will have a more broader general discussion with all the speakers involved and, um, and with you, hopefully. So I warmly, invite, I warmly invite you to join this conversation and start writing your questions or comments in the chat whenever they come up. Don't wait until the end, please. And uh, we will take them up and um, give them to our um, presenters. Um, one last remark, Rosie, our first speaker, will unfortunately have to leave a little bit earlier. So please, if you have questions to her, start writing them in the chat during her presentations or directly after so that she will be able to answer them. So um, quickly, let me, hello, Rosie. Hello. Uh, let me quickly introduce our speakers. I think I will just do all uh, all of them in one row, but it's not very long. Um, so Rosa, Rosie Mandardini is our first speaker. She is the managing director of the Citizen Science Center in Zurich, a joint effort of the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich. And she has a background in physics and started her career at CERN in Geneva, where she first discovered citizen science. From 2008 to 2015, she was an associate director at the World Economic Forum, managing the Young Global Leaders alumni community. Then she moved to the Citizen Cyber Lab at the University of Geneva before taking up her current position in Zurich in 2018. Then the second speaker will be Clea, Clea Madeleine Clea Montanari, <laughs> her whole name, is a master's student at uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands where she studies environmental sciences with a specialization in sustainable development diplomacy. She entered the field of citizen science by joining the citizen science SDG maxim maximization group and also conducted an internship at the citizen science center in Zurich and also at the citizen cyber lab in Geneva to understand how the overarching principle of the UN to leave no one behind could be integrated in citizen science projects. She also carried out a translation of sustainable development goals indicator methodology so that these could be more accessible to citizen scientists. And last but not least, we have Elise who joins us. She's also a co-author of um, one of the papers that is presented here and she will join us as a discussant in the discussion at the very end. She's a postdoc in geography at the University of Leuven in Belgium. And her research focus lies on spatiotemporal modeling of environmental risks using data from crowdsourcing and citizen science. She also supervises PhD researchers working on data quality for citizen science, motivation and incentives, and the potential uptake of citizen science for policymakers. She currently is involved in several citizen science projects in Uganda, Congo, and Rwanda. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, I hand over to Rosie now to start the first presentation. Thank you, Fanny. And uh, hello and good morning, everybody. And welcome to the first uh, session of this conference that will focus on the role of citizen science for the SDGs. So what I will do, I will just give an overview of some key concepts uh, and some of the activities that are already going on. Uh, this session is uh, prepared by the Citizen Science Center in Zurich uh, and by the network uh, of uh, Citizen Science in Austria. These are only two of the many um, institutions and centers that are working on this topic, both in Europe uh, and in the rest of the world. So the first important thing to know, and probably you know this, is that uh, the Sustainable Development Goals are the sequel of a previous similar initiative by the UN that uh, called the Millennium Development Goals, uh, that from the year 2000 to 2015 uh, had as a name to solve these eight goals. Uh, 
eradicate poverty and hunger, education for everybody, gender equality, a lot about health, child mortality, maternal health, HIV, IDS, something on sustainability, water and sanitation especially, and then partnership. So eight goals from the year 2000 to the year 2015. And in the year 2015, a lot of conversations and discussions uh, about uh, where the goals uh, um, reach, where they achieved. And I think it's, it's very complicated. Um, and uh, you can say, um, I mean, look at this table. Um, basically, I think it's pretty fair to say that they were not achieved overall. However, some of them were. Some countries, um, did enormous advancement and achieve some of the targets. Some other didn't. Uh, some other did some step forward uh, without really reaching the goals. However, there is one thing where that everybody really agreed uh, that is that the advancements in terms of just quality of life on like saving life globally was amazing. Certainly more than 20 million people were saved, uh, their lives were saved thanks uh, to the progresses that were made uh, due to this push of the goals. So basically what happened in 2015 is that the UN and the 193 countries that are part of it all agreed and decided that it was well worth to keep the effort going. However, this time from instead of eight goals, we have 17 goals, as you well know, they cover really a little bit of everything, everything that is important to basically make our planet a better place, a fair place for everybody and a sustainable place. Um, just uh, on the side, I think it's very important to, to say this since we are in citizen science and crowdsourcing is, uh, you know, the, the process to decide the goals were, was very inclusive compared to the initial one for the Millennium Development Goals. And the one thing that was done by the UN was this huge survey asking people worldwide what their priorities were if they had to, to choose. And 8 million people participated and shared their opinion on this. So let's see how it works. So we said there are 17 goals, um, and for which are, as you said, as you saw, very general uh, as a statement. And then for each goal, there are a certain number of targets. And these targets are a little bit more specific on, on what the goal really tried to achieve. And then for each target, for a total of 169 targets. And then for each target, there are a certain number of indicators, again, for a total of 231 unique indicators. And the indicators are actually the numbers somehow, the quantities that you are trying to measure in order to see if you're actually reaching the targets and finally the goals. Just you know, an example here of this concept. So goal three, ensuring healthy life and promote well-being for all at all ages. Again, this is like the general concept. Then let's look at target one, for instance, 3.1 is more specific about reducing the mor maternal mortality ratio to less than 70%. And then for this target, you have two indicators that again are at this point what you are trying to measure. So the maternal mortality ratio is one, and the proportion of births attended by skilled health personnel is another one. So you can see that at the very bottom of the goals are actually numbers, are data that we are trying to measure. So what can citizen science do to help this? And there have been studies and there have been publications, and I mention here um, only three, which I think are, very relevant because they take the subject from a very general point of view. They're not specific of a certain domain or a certain way to do citizen science, they're very general. Um, and all of these studies and publications agree on these three main ways uh, to, for citizen science to help. And again, I'm using the terminology here of uh, Sarah West and their colleagues. So the first one is citizen science can help define the goals. Uh, 
they are quite vague, as we have seen. And sometimes people may think that they are very far from that, from them. So one thing is to identify challenges and priorities that are closer to people's life. The second, of course, which is probably also the main one, is uh, to monitor, provide data. And we know that by now, citizen science project can provide quality data. And this will help uh, the national statistical offices, which are the one in each country that are in charge of providing this data to have, you know, potentially a better both a spatial and temporal resolution of their data. And then again, last but not least, uh, to achieve the SDGs, you know, one thing is to monitor and collect data and see where we are. But I think at the end of the story, what we all really want uh, is uh, to achieve this. And citizen science can do it by, by, with their power to change attitudes and behavior. However, if you look at these three terms, uh, define, monitor, and implement, they have in common or at least what citizen science can do for the goals. It's something that is at the bottom of all of them, which is the power of citizen science to make the goals local, to make them closer to the people, to consider people experience, people knowledge. They know what is going on at their level and they can probably act on it much better than maybe, you know, some central entity somewhere else. They also allow, citizen science allows to work at a more realistic scale for people. Um, citizen science is basically very local in nature. So even if some of the projects are then, have then a global reach, they most of the time start at the local level. And another important thing is that this allows to adapt the indicators and the target to some specific national and subnational context, which is something that even though these proxy indicators, which are somehow highlighting local pro um, priorities. So a lot of ha is happening already in these three fields. Um, there are, and I'm sure there are much more, I just mentioned some of the groups that were created uh, to work on this topic. And for instance, the Citizen Science and SDG Maximization Group, Claire already mentioned that. This was actually created at the EXA conference two years ago uh, for people that were interested in this topic and more than 80 people joined from all over the world. Then there is the Citizen Science Global Partnership. You may have heard about it. You will probably hear more uh, at this conference about the work of this group, a lot on, C on SDGs. There is the We Observe SDG and Citizen Science Community of Practice. And then there is the Citizen Science for the SDGs uh, CODATA Working Group, where CODATA is the Committee of Data of the International Science Association. So a lot of groups already working on this. So what is happening? What is this group doing? Well, one big work uh, is uh, um, in terms of data. So basically to position Citizen Science as an official provider of data for the UN. So this is not easy. The UN is pretty specific in what they are, they want and what they're looking for. So there is some work to do, first of all, within the community to promote interoperability and standard of citizen science data. And then to basically see how this data can, um, can respond, can map uh, the different indicators. And one of the papers that I mentioned before and just, just was released uh, not long ago is exactly um, about looking how citizen science can actually contribute specifically to the data. Another activity that these groups are doing is advocacy, uh, a lot with the UN. So this is really trying to convince the national statistical offices and the UN bodies that they can count on citizen science. And this implies really like going there, going to their event, going to their conferences, um, 
work in close collaboration with them and a lot is already happening and this is especially in Switzerland with WHO, WMO and many of the international institutions and there is of course an ongoing collaboration with UN environment again I'm sure you will hear about a lot of this uh, um, during this conference. Overall a need that has been identified is really to find for citizen science a new narrative, a more powerful narrative. Somehow we realize that we haven't managed yet to come across uh, with our narrative in a way that really um, illustrates the power of citizen science. Uh, and here I would like to spend a little bit more time about some work that has been done within the CODATA uh, working group. And again, Clea mentioned it at the beginning because this was uh, initially um, started by Clea during their internship in, Gen in Geneva in Switzerland uh, and, and Zurich. Uh, and then it was continued by another student, another master's student who was an intern uh, at the CODATA, CODATA working group. And basically the work was to translate, so all of the data for, for the indicators, what the UN is looking for is actually pretty specific. However, if you start looking into it, there is some kind of jargons that the UN use and that may be not very easy to interpret for us, you know, for an average citizen scientist, for, for a scientist that is trying to set up a project. So one idea was to really try to explain that language and make it so simple that people can actually, when they are setting up a citizen science project or where they are joining a citizen science project, see how their activity can contribute to the goal. And this can, of course, demystify the goals, raise awareness, of the goal and especially empower uh, citizen science projects to actually contribute. And uh, here I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, the documents that have been produced at the moment, they are on four specific indicators uh, on the goal of three, 11, sustainable cities, climate action, life on land. Um, they will be made public very soon um, in, you know, as wide as possible really at the level of the citizen science community and they go from the definition of the concept to what can you do as a citizen scientist which project you can contribute to if you really want to contribute to the indicators which again is a very specific uh, kind of activity that you can do I will talk now about um, my center and the, the two centers, uh, just to tell you what uh, we are doing at the moment uh, to contribute uh, to, this, uh, to this activity. So the Citizen Science Center in Zurich has been created by the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich to support both research and citizens uh, in the implementation of citizen science project. And this is done both at the local level in Zurich for the researchers in the two institutions, but also to support the citizens and scientists everywhere in Switzerland and beyond that. And the way we do that is that we provide tools, um, platform where a mobile, this is what you usually need for the most generic and general kind of projects. Uh, we provide some knowledge about the methodology if you want to start a project and you don't know exactly how to go about that. Uh, community management, as you all know, uh, community management is a very important aspect and, and often underestimated of uh, setting up and running citizen science projects. So Fanny, that is the chair of this session, she's actually the community manager of the center. And then we provide networking. We work uh, with a lot of partners uh, um, in Europe and beyond uh, um, with different kinds of citizen science where we don't have the expertise. We can put you in contact with the right people and also provide some kind of partnerships if needed. One more thing I would like to highlight is we launched very recently, still in beta, the Citizen Science Project Builder. This is a web-based tool to create and run data analysis citizen science projects. So it's a very specific kind of projects. However, it's very common. 
And before you invest a lot of time and resources and energy into setting up like huge projects, I really invite everybody and again, citizens and scientists alike to come to the builder, set up quickly and easily just the pilot and the test for your project and then really um, run and evolve it with your community. So the Austrian Citizen Science Network is also doing a lot in terms of local activities in view, I mean, to, to contribute to the SDGs. So they open up their databases for ecological citizen science project in Austria, and they also um, wrote some guidelines on how to do that. If by any chance you want as well to open your database, of ecological data. They also did a list of uh, repositories for open biodiversity data like GBIF, which contribute directly to the SDGs. So again, if you are into biodiversity projects, you can just look at this list and see where and how you can open your data to actually be used in this global effort. Uh, they're also doing a lot for advocacy and raising awareness. And in particular, I invite you to go and read their blogs. They have a blog, blogging teams uh, in their platform that really focuses on citizen science for the SDGs. It is in German at the moment, uh, but uh, they really want uh, um, to make it available in more languages. Uh, this is really part of localization. The, the Citizen Science Project Builder that I mentioned before as well is in German and English, and soon we'll cover the other Swiss languages, French and Italian, hopefully more than that. I will stop here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Rosie, for the interesting presentation. And you're done a little bit earlier, so that gives us even a bit more time for the questions. We already received uh, four questions in the chat and three comments. So I just start by going through them one by one. I don't know if you maybe also saw some of them, but I will just read them aloud. So Igno Notamans um, says, good morning. I would be interested to ask whether citizen science actively interacts or works with policy and policy makers in working on the SDGs? If so, on which level, like local or national? And can you give examples of interaction and collaboration for this? So, um, I mean, at the policy level, for some reason, so as I said, that there is a lot of activity that is going on um, of interaction with the national statistical offices, because these are the people that are actually the one in charge of providing data uh, to their government and the government to the UN. And so reaching out to these particular kind of people is one of the main goals of all of these different uh, groups uh, that are trying to, um, to you know, um, support and promote the use of citizen science for the goal. And for that, uh, I think the UNEP, uh, you know, the UN Environment Protection Activity, and again, you will hear more of this uh, in the days to come of the activity that is already going on with UNEP and with one, uh, you know, of, of, of the statistician at UNEP that is really reporting to the national statistical offices. So at the global level, this is where I'm not, we are not talking to policymakers at the local level, but I know what, what is happening is talking to the policymakers at the local level. And this is happening, and there are a lot of examples of projects that did manage to do that. And um, you may have heard, and again, I'm, I'm not the best person to, to give examples. I don't have examples in Zurich yet and in Switzerland, but there are examples in the UK. There are projects that, for instance, uh, measured the uh, you know noise level in uh, in you know local places squares a part of the cities and with that data generated by citizen science project they went to the local policy makers to actually change the use of the square change the traffic uh, there are projects uh, like the the curious nose and the, the um, you know the belgian pro uh, project that is uh, looking at air quality uh, I know that their data 
uh, I don't know if directly um, changed, uh, contributed to some change uh, of policy at the level of the traffic, uh, but for sure definitely changed the conversation around air quality and air quality in cities. So yes, I mean, this is really happening uh, at all different levels. Mm -hmm. One uh, attendee also wrote down an example in the chat. I want to share with you maybe, Rosie, in case you didn't see it, Simona Cerato from Trieste wrote that they have a city youth council or youth city council in the city. And they're working on some of the SDGs um, to make proposals to the city council to improve the life of everybody. This is also something interesting to look into. Um, the next question was from Marco. Uh, he's wondering if there is space also for more qualitative discussions rather than only quantitative in forms of quantitative data um, for citizen science uh, and the SDGs on the international level. Of course, I mean, as you can imagine, one of the main uh, um, issues, if you want, in this whole operation of using citizen science for the SDGs is exactly the quality of data. And, uh, and a lot of the activity that these groups are doing is really trying to convince the national statistical offices that if you do citizen science in the correct way, in the right way, there are ways that you can ensure the quality of the data. However, yes, this is, um, this is definitely a, a discussion that, that is happening at, at all level, at local level and the international level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then we have a question from Gitte Krak. Um, Yep. I'm really sorry. There, is, there was another thing that I wanted to, to add. Uh, sorry if I interrupt mm -hmm. about the quality of the data, because again, uh, another concept that somehow I want to give you um, that is, I think, uh, very specific of the SDGs, but actually something that can be applied very generally in citizen science is that sometimes, sometimes you can compromise a little bit uh, on the quality of the data for a quality that is called fit to purpose or or let's say um and and again i don't want to say that you don't have to collect quality data but what i'm saying is that sometimes when the quality of your data maybe is not up to the very very strict level for instance that the national statistical office would require you most of the time however the quantity of data that uh, citizen science projects can provide can be used anyhow, for instance, to highlight priorities. Uh, there are certain data that, despite the fact that they may not be you know, correct at the you know, mil, mil, you know, 0.01%, they are obviously, because of the quantity, because of the, of the, especially again, local nature of them, they can really be used for other purposes, like they want to highlight a specific projects, a specific issues or problem that can then be studied more carefully and maybe in a different way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so Gitte wants to know where this work, the Citizen Science Guide to the SDG Indicators, will be published. Um, so this was uh, actually shared uh, by, by the contributors uh, really in the Codeta um, assembly a couple of days ago. So it's very new. We are, we are wondering, we are thinking, we are planning. Uh, we, are, we would really certainly like to put it in the Citizen Science Global Partnership website and make them also available you know, in a broader way so that everybody could you know, potentially download and put them in their website. Hopefully we will certainly put it in the EXA you know, database that you probably know very well by now. So we will try to, to put uh, this information in all possible ways. And, and I also have a call for action because somehow those documents are limited to four indicators at the moment, uh, plus the initial work that Clea did on water with you and water. But, you know, there are more than 230 indicators out there. So if the citizen science community want to contribute, uh, then there is a lot of work potentially can be done together. Mm -hmm. Very well. Um, let me see. There were more. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, maybe one 
um, by one question by Laura. She's wondering if our center in Zurich is uh, how it's financed, uh, if it's a public institution. And maybe when you talk about the center, you could also mention how the project builder is support or has the potential to support the SDGs on the local level as well. Yeah, so the Citizen Science Center um, is a, a competence center has been uh, is created and supported entirely by the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich. So these are like two local institutions in Switzerland. However, the idea is uh, to support and to develop tools and methodologies and way to do things that can actually be used, you know, way beyond uh, Zurich and Switzerland. So one of them, and again, you will hear a lot more about this, especially if you join the launch of the new uh, EU project Cl crowd for SDGs uh, at lunchtime, you will hear a lot more about that. Um, this center of Zurich together with the Citizen, Science, uh, Citizen Cyber Lab in Geneva, uh, we are developing tools, uh, uh, we call it uh, the SDG solution kit uh, that are open and available for everybody to create citizen science projects specifically for the SDGs. The citizen science project builder, you as a researcher from anywhere you are, any citizens association, NGOs, you can go online, you will see it's a very simple step-by-step -step process. You have to have your data ready. Can be images, can be text, can be video, can be audio, can be PDF, can also be social media, and you can, in, um, involve uh, uh, you know citizens your contributors your community into analyzing this data in different ways uh, it's open is is somehow supported by um, by zurich uh, the creation has been supported by geneva as well um, but the idea is is really there for everyone for everybody in the community mm -hmm. okay thank you um now the Questions are really flying in. <laughs> um, uh, let me see. Alba wanted to know if um, she's interested in this localization of the indicators for the SDGs. And her question is, uh, when each country creates their own local indicators, then um, how do you compare? And how do you actually use this to monitor the global process? Well, the, the, let's say the indicators and again, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not, uh, you know, a, a super expert on this. I've been, I've been, you know, working and reading and studying them for quite a long time. However, I don't know the details. Uh, um, the indicators, uh, so the, the, let's say the different government have to report on the official indicators, so the one that the UN established, the 230 something. Um, and there is no, um, you know, different interpretation of that. However, um, it is somehow so obvious to the UN as well that some of the indicators, some of the targets make more sense than others, depending on where you are. Uh, I would just give you an example, you know, I don't know, child mortality rate. Um, you know, some countries really have to work on that. Some other countries, I mean, Switzerland, uh, you know, the fact that you may have a low child mortality rate is not that big of an achievement. They should actually maybe, you know, focus more since that problem is not a big problem in Switzerland. Maybe they should focus more, I don't know, at the opposite side of the spectrum, you know, health for older people or aging people. So it's so dependent on where you are that basically, national government, local government start to think about these proxy indicators that somehow are a way to, you know, say to your national um, government, uh, okay, so this is the indicators, but while in this particular place that may not be a problem, this other, in fact, is a real problem for us. And with this kind of information, you cannot really report at the global level, but you can definitely report at the national level. And you can push your policymaker at the global level to go all the way up to national to actually highlight issues that should be tackled. I hope I answered this. I hope it was clear. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Another question is before we have to, well, we have four minutes left. Uh, Marina wants to know if there are some qualitative, in qualitative indicators again. Maybe you answered that already. And um, like indicators to assess the impact of citizen science in support of the SDGs. And if yes, where are they, are, where are they available? Where can you find them? Uh, well, this is a, a very good point, and I wish there were, but uh, as far as I know, um, we don't have at the moment any way to actually evaluate, uh, uh, you know, which kind of the contribution that, that citizen science can give. I think, again, I really, really encourage you to go and read the papers uh, that I have. Uh, probably my slides will be shared somewhere. Um, to tell you, I mean, that's that's really the work, the most detailed work that has been done up to now at the level of how practically citizen science can contribute to the indicators. And uh, what you're asking, unfortunately, as far as I know, uh, is not there yet. We haven't established a way to actually, you know, evaluate how citizen science, how, how well they are contributing and which are the, the factors to look at. Um, but a lot is explained in those papers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then one final question that uh, Dana brought up, Dana Mar, and that a lot of people apparently also find interesting in the chat is um, if you could elaborate on what citizen science um, advocates understand as empowerment and why this category is used. Empowerment, because Again, if you are a citizen and you look at these, uh, you know, big efforts, 17 goals from the UN, um, I think that most of the people out there, most of us, uh, um, you would really feel powerless. You know, I mean, yeah, okay, they're doing it. What can I do, actually, right? I mean, this is not something that concerns me. Um, and this is something that we should really fight against because citizens uh, are at the core of this. They are also at the core of the UN documents that talk about the SDGs. You know, citizens are mentioned everywhere, that they are, you know, again, at the core of the effort. Um, so, however, again, is, it may not be clear how to contribute to that. And uh, for many people, but I will talk very personal, I mean, for me at the specific, uh, Citizen science is it is an empowering tool because uh, you can do something. I mean, and again, you can at the very local level, you can simply worry about changing things. Forget about the UN, forget about the goals, forget about the details of the indicators. I just want to make my city a better place. And you can do it with citizen science because, as I mentioned before, you can collect data on things that don't work, on the quality of water, or the quality of air, or the noise. And then you simply, starting local, you make your city a better place. And then maybe you expand from that. Um, however, again, there are people that are way more interested in actually contributing exactly to the indicator. So having this role of, uh, I want to give you data so, though, so you, you know, UN big organization know what is actually going on. And citizen science can do that as well. If you do it in a certain way, if you do it correctly, if you know what you have to look for the moment you are setting up a project, you can contribute in that way as well. So again, mm -hmm. very powerful. Thank you. In both sense. Oh. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> to sharply I interrupt you. <laughs> 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 thank you for this passionate statement. <laughs> it was perfect for the end. And uh, also thank you for your presentation and for the discussion. And uh, yeah, see you around at the conference. Thank I you hope. very much. <laughs> Bye. So, uh, yeah, let me just quickly hand over to our next speaker, who is Clea. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so, as mentioned, um, I will be talking about Agenda 2030's overarching principle, Leave No One Behind uh, in Citizen Science. Um, this essay is a collaboration with Mordecai Hackley, uh, Maria Rosa Rosi Mondardini, Lisbeth Jacobs, and Felix Corbena Doncor, um, and myself. 
Of course. Um, Mordecai Hackley uh, is a senior lecturer in geographical information science in the Department of Civil, Environmental and Geomatic Engineering at University College London. Maria Rosa Mondardini, as you have just met her, is the um, director of the Citizen Science in Zurich. Uh, Lisbeth Jacob is a postdoctor researcher at KU Leuven. And Felix Corbena Doncor is a research associate at the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences of the University of South Africa. So first I wanted to um, just give a brief um, idea of the origin of this essay. So as mentioned, I worked uh, and joined the Sustainable Development and Citizen Science Maximization Group that formed in September 2018. Um, and one of the tasks of this maximization group was to make sure that uh, Goal 17 or more um, uh, importantly, the concept of leave no one behind, of the UN Agenda 2030 is built into citizen science projects by providing tools and guides for inclusiveness, equity, and empowerment. I was asked to initiate the task and contact members of the working group to uh, still understand their interest. Um, so what I did is I sent out a survey and got some of the answers which are just um, in this figure. Um, and one of the answers was from uh, Mordecai Hackley, who was proposing that we write an essay that looked at the relationship between citizen science and this principle, leave no one behind. So briefly, the content of the presentation, um, I'm going to be speaking about what we understand as the practice of citizen science, um, citizen science and the relationship of the SDGs, um, the sustainable development goals a little bit briefly themselves, um, the overarching principle of the uh, SDGs, citizen science and leave no one behind. So basically um, we offer to look at leave no one behind within citizen science. And the aim of this essay is to provide a framework in order for citizen science practitioners um, to, to do this. And in general, the citizen science community to understand a little bit more of this dimension within citizen science. Um, and then I'll be presenting the framework and that's it. So citizen science, as we understand it, uh, is a collaborative endeavor between individuals that have acquired formal scientific training and credentials, uh, also called scientists, uh, and members of the public, also called lay individuals, in scientific research effort to produce scientific-based knowledge. Um, the members of the public or lay people can really include a wide uh, variety of actors, um, and this is by far not an exhaustive list, uh, but it can be amateur experts, concerned community members, and or school students. So um, I would like to um, talk a little bit about um, the SDGs, but uh, the Rosie's presentation really went over it, so I won't um, go into much detail. Uh, but yes, basically the sustainable development goals have 17 goals in them um, and they are actually, they make up 2030's agenda uh, developed by the United Nations, also entitled Transforming Our World. Um, what they're supposed to, there's 193 countries that have ratified them um, and each country that has ratified them have made a pledge that um, their development will um, be geared towards achieving these goals uh, by 2030. This is the ideal. Um, so the goals, there are 17 goals, then there is, um, they're broken down or elaborated into targets. And then these targets are operationalized by indicators, which have a methodology to themselves. Um, and these indicators allow for countries to uh, monitor their progress. And this is how globally we know how well the world is doing in achieving these goals or not. Or not. Um, so citizen science and the sustainable development goals the relationship has been highlighted in the literature and is currently um, being promoted. I mean, we just heard um, uh, also Rosie has mentioned this. Um, it's being promoted as a practice citizen science um, that can give data and that can help monitor um, these goals and can also include and involve citizens that usually wouldn't be uh, involved in the monitoring of these goals. So the first um, Western Patman was uh, one of the first literatures that highlighted this and just highlighted that um, citizen science could help in um, defining national and subnational targets and metrics, monitoring progress and implementing action. 
Then Fritz and Nell in 2019 actually showed, um, demonstrated the character it went more into detail, sorry, about the data, the data that citizen science could provide and how it could answer to a lot of the challenges that monitoring the SDGs um, is encountering, which is traditional sources of data, which are some national surveys are costly. Um, the cycle of data is quite infrequent. Um, and they also have, uh, they have a restricted spatial dimension. And also their skepticism on accuracy, openness, and coverage of some official um, data sets. And first and I'll highlight that um, the data of citizen science could, um, for example, have um, a more a better temporal and spatial dimension than what is currently available um, because of um, citizens being able to uh, are just more sparse around the world and um, more people are able to contribute and also more frequent because of the citizen science some citizen science projects have very uh, good um, data cycles and then Friesel and Al just really recently um, uh, published a paper that as Rosie mentioned mapped out um, each citizen uh, well looked at each indicator that make up uh, the sustainable development goals and try to found a citizen science project that linked and that could potentially contribute uh, to that indicator. Uh, what they found is that at least one indicator um, that citizen science could contribute to at least one indicator in each of the 17 SDGs, that citizen science is actually already contributing to five indicators, um, and they could directly or supplementarily contribute to 76 indicators, um, which accounts for a total of 33% of the SDGs indicators. So, um, but what about um, Agenda's 2030s overarching principle, leave no one behind? Um, it hasn't really been mentioned in the literature when we regard citizen science uh, involvement in the SDGs. Um, we don't also talk about um, this principle. So uh, this principle is actually overarching to the sustainable development goals and they are a response to the highly criticized Millennium Development Goals that Rosie also uh, mentioned, which were the goals previous to that, that were really criti highly criticized for not addressing um, uh, inequality. And so the Sustainable Development uh, Goals or agenda was adorned uh, was uh, with this principle. And the idea is that all goals help achieve um, uh, that leave no one behind seeps within all goals so that all goals should be achieved for everyone in this world and no one should be left behind no one should be excluded from uh, what uh, we call human development progress um they are um we used this paper, used um, a, dis a discussion report uh, paper developed by the United Nations Development Program to, to, to really understand what leave no one behind means. Um, and it has uh, two main cores, which is to eradicate extreme poverty and to act explicitly to ensure that the ones that have been left behind can catch up to those who have experienced greater progress. So, um, they're really embodied in the foundation of the United Nations Charter of Human Rights, um, uh, which uphold the principles of equality and non-discrimination. Um, so in general, we uh, it is highlighted and recognized that people are left behind uh, when they lack the choices and capabilities uh, that enable others to participate in or benefit from human development. And this can be because of absolute deprivation or relative disadvantage. And absolute deprivation is where they live in multidimensional poverty or below uh, other minimally accepted standards of security, income, public services, uh, infrastructure, or well being. And the relative disadvantage is when they face exclusion, discrimination, um, and or entrenched inequalities. Uh, in, and are less able to gain influence or get an education, survive setbacks. So, so they do not have the same opportunities that everyone else has. Um, so um, currently this pledge is actually um, only monitored by the disaggregation of the, the, the data uh, for each indicator. Um, and there's been a development of a multidimensional poverty index, which um, this, the UN is calling for countries to develop their own or to make it more uh, um, 
fit for their own context. Um, interpretation of what putting leaving no one behind means is um, varies, but there is one um, general understanding that a first step to actually tackle this pledge and to realize it is to first identify who is left behind. So the UNDP um, in this discussion framework also highlights that uh, the, there's three steps to, um, to achieving this pledge is first to examine, so examine who is left behind, enact. Um, so um, because you understand to, um, sorry, readdress, uh, you've understood who is left behind and why, and enact is then uh, take action on this understanding um, and readdress some of the uh, processes that cause people to be left behind and then empower those who have been left behind. So our argument basically um, is to really look at um, both leave no one behind in citizen science and citizen science should be examined to understand and identify who is left out in the possibility of taking part of its diverse forms of practice. Um, citizen science participating in the monitoring of the sustainable development goals, as Friesel um, 2020 uh, highlights, is a science-driven approach that places citizens at the heart of the sustainable development goals, um, and which would also enable them to inform policy. It has been highlighted that inequality is is uh, for, is a further of a bit of a increases, inequality increases um, when individuals are actually left out in the ability to um, make decisions. And what citizen science collaboration or involvement with the SDGs kind of them, it entails that people will have uh, a bigger say, a bigger involvement in, um, in monitoring their environment and therefore themselves um, uh, helping or informing policy. So in some ways, uh, participating in decision making. Um, so this is more of a, of a call and this is why we argue that also um, citizen science as a practice um, should be examined to understand who it is, who uh, it leaves behind and who is not, does not have the possibility to partake uh, in, uh, in it if they would like to. So to do this, uh, basically what we offer is to uh, first examine citizen science and identify who is left behind. So uh, we have developed a framework and um, in this framework there we have broken down citizen science in three different dimensions. And um, these different dimensions that they inspire themselves from existing topologies um, that, uh, that typify what citizen science is. Um, so the first one is uh, within creation. And um, basically, uh, the first dimension, it it's inspires itself from a very, we're a very well-known topology, which uh, um, categorizes citizen science based on the level of collaboration between a citizen and a scientist in the scientific research process. And it will be judged by how many steps is a citizen involved in um, the scientific research process. So this is our within creation, and we offer to look at who is left behind within uh, within that dimension of citizen science. Then within practice, really um, inspires itself from the typology um, that look at the type of tasks um, that non-scientists are asked to get involved in. Um, and in the literature, it has been referred uh, to mode of knowledge production by stressor, by participation design, by form of engagement. And this includes the type of task that a member of public is asked to do, uh, the skills that this participant may require in order to carry it out, and also perhaps the prior knowledge um, that the participant is asked to have. And the third one inspires itself um, by typologies that classify participatory endeavor that look at the goal orientation of that uh, project. And Wiggins and Krausen, for example, have identified five different uh, goal orientations that projects have, which are action, um, conservation, education, um, virtual um, investigation, um, and I believe that's it. So these are the three uh, different dimensions that we look. And now I'm going to just give examples of um, how we may look at citizen science, how that would enable us, sorry, to look at citizen science and understand, well, who is left behind in each. 
So the first one within creation, um, I've the the way that we have an observed or understood to see if this framework could help us understand who is left behind is also by looking at literature and identifying extracts of um, that demonstrates how people are not included um, in citizen science. So within creation, for example, um, individuals with less formal education and lack of familiarity with science and scientific processes can act as a hurdle. Um, this has been uh, also um, talked about um, in, another li in other literatures, uh, which say that, for example, citizen science um, families and community cultures that have a low science capital generally engage less with science and science related activities and generally um, feel like it is not for them. Um, and this is backed up with also the culture of some of these um, scientific uh, centers um, where citizen science happens, the culture is not really inclusive and doesn't ask for many other people to engage. Um, then within practice, um, looking at the type of activity, um, the tasks within the activity, the skills that these participants may require in order to carry out the task. Um, these are two very, um, I think, Common examples that you would find in the literature, but the first one is basically the lack of access to technology that individuals may have. And the technology that is required of a citizen science project is not accessible to everyone um, around the world. Um, and another one is a leisure time. Um, as practicing or being involved in citizen science sometimes requires, the, uh, requires individuals to have free time to do so. And individuals, for example, that have a low socioeconomic status uh, are not able to do it as easily. The third dimension is within purpose. Um, and again, it's really looking at the primary goal orientation. And so, for example, um, one of the first uh, one um, is one of the first purpose of uh, that is highlighted by Wiggins and Crafton is action. And action um, projects are defined as those um, who have a primary goal to, um, to include the community and for them for the inter intervention in local concerns. And these projects generally have a grassroots um, uh, bottom-up initiative or they they come from a bottom-up initiative um and do not very do not have a strong organizational structure um and sustainably in the long term um financially uh, they are uh, they don't have any very, very strong financial so i'm sorry long-term um uh, finances sorry um so in here um hackley 2015 mentions that um, projects in which the participants set the research questions and carry out the research is more challenging, mostly because such bottom-up practices are done with limited budgets and the coordination overheads of such activities at a regional scale are beyond the abilities of small organizations. So this dimension um, may just highlight how some projects with certain goal orientations within citizen science um, have less of a chance to actually succeed and to actually take part perhaps in the SDGs uh, because they do not have uh, the capacities to have a good organizational structure or have um, the uh, have a good long-term uh, financial plan. So these are the three dimensions and relating it a little bit more to the concept of leaving the one behind because we do believe that it, um, it can be useful to understand who is being left behind in citizen science. Um, is incorporating also these five factors, which are discrimination, geography, socioeconomic status, governance and laws, shocks and fragility, um, which have been highlighted by the United Nations Development Program as being behind exclusionary processes. So one way that these can be related to citizen science is, for example, I'm just um, going to give a two or three examples is that discrimination is basically uh, people are left behind um, when they experience ex exclusion, bias or mistreatments uh, in laws, policies, access to public services and social practices due to their identity, so ascribed or assumed. Um, so it's really people that are not able to take part in, for example, social practices, which we could argue citizen science is a social practice because of their identity. Um, and this could 
help us look at citizen science and ask, well, how is discrimination observed in citizen science and does discrimination hinder individuals' opportunity to partake in citizen science as a practice? The other one, geography, really looks at the place of residence. How are people left behind, uh, denied social and economic opportunities um, because of their place of residence? And this can also include technology. Um, socioeconomic status really looks at people are left behind when they lack the opportunities and capabilities to earn an adequate income or accumulate wealth um, and or otherwise equitably uh, and fully participate in their economy or society. And here we can see that, uh, well, citizen science can be for some actually participating within their society. Um, governance, laws and institutions, some of them are set back um, because these institutions are ineffective, unjust, exclusive or corrupt. Um, or laws and policies and budgets that are inequitable, discriminatory or regressive. And this can kind of uh, shed light on the institutions that within citizen science. How are these uh, not enabling more participation, more inclusive participation? Then there's shocks and fragility. Um, people are left behind where they're vulnerable to risk related to violence, conflict, displacement, large movement by migration. Uh, natural hazards, induced disasters, and other types of climate events. Um, and so what they allow, these five different factors, is um, help analyze each dimensions of citizen science and understand why and who can be left behind, uh, perhaps not thought about before. And I thought this was a good example, but vulnerability to shocks, um, perhaps people might not really understand how this is relevant to understanding who is and who is not included in citizen science, but individuals that have that are in precarious uh, situations may not actually have um, a good grounding, a good place of belonging, which um, may be necessary to actually partake in a citizen science project. And you, a, a citizen science project has to be seen as important or as you, or you have the ability to actually carry out your interest for you to partake in it. And these individuals um, that are not in a very stable condition, well, will not be able to. Um, and this may be important if um, we would like them to be also included in the monitoring of the SDGs and in their achievement. So this is what we propose. We propose for citizen science to be examined within creation, within practice, within purpose, which are the, th the first row at the top. And within each of these dimensions, look at these five factors, which are discrimination, geography, socioeconomic status, governance, shocks and fragility. And um, I'm just, I just highlighted uh, extracts of the literature that um, kind of um, show, demonstrate how this framework can be used. Um, and our intention with this framework is really to um, create an active consideration, active conversation in the citizen science community for us to highlight and be a bit more transparent about who this practice is actually accessible to. And we make the argument, especially if citizen science is being promoted as a practice um, that can that will be involved in the SDGs, um, in the monitoring of the sustainable development goals. Um, and with that, um, thank you very much. And I look forward to comments, feedback and questions. Thank you very much, Clea, for this very interesting presentation. Um, and welcome, Lise, also on the stage. Uh, as agreed, we or you, the two of you, will answer questions together. And uh, we have some. Let me scroll up a little bit. We have some questions that came in while you were talking, Clea. Um, one was one that you also partially already answered in in your slides that followed to the question but maybe you can just wrap it up in like one or two sentences what would you advise or what advice would you give to a practitioner who wants to increase the connection between their programs and the sdgs um well, first of all, it really depends on the, I guess, how they want to get involved in the SDGs, which indicator, which topic. Um, but one of them is just to be a little bit more aware of um, their project themselves, who it is leaving behind. So, um, one of the concerns of um, that these that we as authors shared was that we didn't want to shame and praise different practices within citizen science. Um, 
but it's more uh, to uh, highlight um, and be and just be aware of who the practice is being leave, leaving behind, so that in itself we can just report and and understand who is participating, who is not participating in the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. So I I, um, I guess an advice would be. Um, just to be aware and also communicate it transparently to the rest of the citizen science community. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then one comment I find personally also very interesting because it kind of switches the perspective from inside to the outside and kind of gives a, gives it a, a, another, um, yeah. Yeah. Let's say perspective on the whole question is uh, what would you say about, like who is really left behind? Is it the people who are not joining citizen science projects or could it also be that um, our institutions are kind of left behind? So a, a comment from Marco was that many potential participants are not left behind, but they are doing their things outside formal institutions and they do that very well, efficient and just work on their own. And, and build up their own initiatives rather than join up with established formal institutions. So what would you what would your opinion be on that? Are, could we also consider that our established institutions like universities or big centers are maybe left behind? Um, I wouldn't necessarily call for every citizen science projects to be part of an institution. Um, it's it's the, these are not citizen science projects which are left behind, but it is more, um, for example, the within purpose is, is, I believe it's a dimension that can look at the organizational structure of a citizen science project. Um, and it's more projects that, for example, lack resources or lack credibility within the scientific institutions, for example. So they're not actually able to build up and they're not actually able to happen, therefore perhaps not uh, participate in the, in the SDGs. Um, and this is what I was trying to highlight with the example of um, action projects, um, that these actual projects generally have a goal to um, to respond to local concern, to local community concerns. And we we're talking about the SDGs um, who basically, we just had a previous presentation that is highlighting how perhaps um, involving citizen science in the SDGs will also enable uh, people to, um, to have more agency and also there's more of um, the SDGs are more related to people's local needs directly. Um, and therefore it's more about what type of citizen science project is actually able to build itself. Uh, and if they're part of institutions, if they're not, uh, I don't think that's really the question, um, depending on how well uh, they it's more if they're recognized by the scientific institutions or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there were also some comments answering to this. For example, when you work with indigenous people, uh, Petra wrote down that she has some experience with this and also agrees with this viewpoint that uh, this whole question of integration <clears throat> can also be seen in a, in a bit of a, you say, um, critical way like is that really what we want to do is that really what our partners want to do um and then also i see here um, ties also wrote i think for some participant groups more autonomy to act outside institution is better than to be integrated but yeah, yeah this is, is an interesting discussion a mm -hmm. comment that i would like to say is is for example the dimension of within creation i think what it um an example that I didn't really highlight, but it has been highlighted, obviously, and I think um, we know this, is that um, the epistemologies, um, uh, for example, other epistemologies than the scientific one are not recognized. Um, and this is people that are left behind. So there is this, this framework could also kind of call for um, and also make visible that different epistemologies are actually not included in citizen science, and these are people that are going to be left behind if if uh, scientific institutions or, or the way a scientist work are now more open to also adapting their way of collecting data, of um, of also recognizing um, um, the way that uh, something can be measured or monitored. 
Okay. Um, then we have another question that I would suggest to Lise yes. to be answered. It's about, um, does the framework that you presented also apply to the global south or is it more a European or Western setting? And what be the most important differences are be between them? Um, Lise, yeah, and maybe so you can also connect this a little bit with, um, with, how, with your experience, how you implement the SDGs and citizen science in the global south in a local yeah. level. That's a very interesting question. Um, thanks for that. Um, yeah, we had a lot of uh, discussion, uh, vivid discussion uh, on that, uh, also with Clea. Um, because indeed, um, we have this framework on, on leave no one behind, but in a citizen science project, whether it's in the north or in the south, you always have to balance um, different targets. So. Um, within our project, we have very clear-cut scientific targets, but we also have targets with regard to science communication, with regard to um, integrating our results into policy making, um, training people, etc. So you have uh, a lot of different targets you have to balance, and that um, does not always allow you um, to fulfill or to tick all the boxes, um, for example, in the Leave No One Behind framework. Um, and in that sense, I think the framework should really be interpreted as a way for practi practitioners who start a citizen science project, who are often um, specialized in one discipline. Um, uh, when I started my first uh, project, uh, I was specialized in physical uh, geography. I did not have a background, but it's this framework is intended for um, people to um, understand um, what the implications are of certain methodological choices. Um, and we felt there, there was a need to do so. Um, so you have to be aware as a practitioner, if you make a certain uh, choice, for example, if you make a choice on um, uh, ideal characteristics of people who contribute, you have to be aware that this has uh, some uh, implications with regard to the leave no one behind targets. And that was a bit our idea. And I think it's universal uh, in, in the north or in the south. I hope that answers uh, a bit the question. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Um, is, there, is there literature that shows which socio-demographic type, especially income level, uh, are likely to participate in citizen science projects? Can you, can you give any advice on literature on that? Um, Yes, there is literature that that have highlighted um, participants that are more um, uh, uh, sorry more prone to actually participating than others, um, and so a lot of them do refer to generally marginalized populations in in, in countries. Um, so if you look at the U.S., Pandya really highlights or looks at uh, African Americans, Indian Americans. Um, these type of communities are generally less likely to participate. Um, based on income levels, um, I haven't seen any literature, maybe Liz, you have, that directly looks at um, populations with certain income, um, but it's more generally said that individuals that do not have um, high income will have less leisure time um, and therefore can, less, can participate less in citizen science. Yeah, and maybe just to add on that, um, that is something that, that, that might be a di bit different um, when um, speaking about the Global North and the Global South, although I dislike a bit that um, uh, difference. Um, but with our, in, in our projects in, in, in Uganda um, and in Congo, um, we do make sure that the people who contribute um, do not have to invest, for example, in the material they need. So we provide all those things um, to in, in order to participate uh, in the projects. Um, in addition, we also compensate them for the mobile data that they use um, or for the transport that they need uh, in order to report on certain, um, let's say, on certain events or in order to um, do their weekly um, uh, reporting. So in that sense, um, it's good to anticipate on these um, bottlenecks for participation um, because they are, um, that's um, uh, that's evident. Um, uh, and in order to, to try to, to alleviate them. Um, and in that sense also, I think it's, it's, it's really crucial that we um, also do research on um, what is 
motivating people to participate in the citizen science project, but also what is hampering them, what is limiting their uh, ability or um, their motivation um, to do so. Yeah, if mm -hmm. I can add on that, we had a conversation with Liz of like, there's a different definitions for citizen science and some definitions ex exclude volunteers which are paid. Um, but in Liz's, uh, for example, project in Uganda, uh, volunteers are given um, just a small incentive to participate. And so I, I think it, citizen science can, the way that it's practiced in the North doesn't necessarily resemble the way that it should be practiced in, in different countries, depending on the capacity, depending on the culture um, and these, these different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also very close to what you just said is um, one of our participants asked if you can really um, hope to engage people in the global south <clears throat> and make them participate if they are hungry. That means like yeah, I guess if they are poor and probably have lots of uh, other problems rather than caring for the environment and for the sustainable development goals. And um, and then, as you just said, Claire uh, Muki uh, replied, Muki Hakla replied that uh, sometimes it's really a practice also to pay people either for for their time or for the um, for their infrastructure or gear that they need. And um, yeah. I mean, it's also a way to look at citizen science as work, and um, it shouldn't. It doesn't have to be free labor if it's if that's what hindering people. It can also be value in form of money in some cases. Yeah, and I want to say that this essay is not a call that everyone should participate in citizen science, but it is more that the opportunity is aware of who is leaving behind, so that. Um, the possibility should be made available to to whomever if they really would want to, especially if if it's going to be a practice that's going to be involved uh, in the sustainable development goals in the monitoring. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, one question from Alba to Lise. In your projects um, that you are involved in, what is the main motivation for the locals to join your project and to participate? Um, <laughs> um, I, I don't have a, a fully um, quantitative uh, uh, answer to that um, because we are currently um, investigating that. So uh, we have a PhD researcher, uh, Mercy Asafet, who is um, working on exactly trying to understand um, these uh, motivational um, uh, reasons for people to, to participate. <laughs> Um, from my experience, um, I noticed that, that people are um, very motivated um, uh, to, to contribute to the knowledge production um, and also the collaboration with the local university and with our university is something that is very attractive to them. Um, and uh, we also try to uh, invest a lot in, in this group feeling of trying to monitor something ourselves, try to... Um, to really value um, their uh, their contribution as a group, um, and I have the impression that that, that is a strong motivator. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, f from your experience, what would you say, given the nature of like I think the majority of what you say traditional citizen science project comes from, you know, nature, uh, biology, geography, you know, the like. The, these kind of sciences that deal with observing something outside the human being. And now today we saw that actually a lot of practical problems in the field could be maybe solved a bit easier if you involve um, social scientists from the beginning, you know, like ethnographers or um, people that have really like speak the language, have, have a knowledge of the culture. Of, of the local people. So would you say that it would actually help if you set up a citizen science project to start working interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary from the beginning? Yeah, uh, I would go even further than help. Uh, I think it would be uh, a prerequisite um, in the sense that, so you have so many, you have ethical considerations, technical challenges, your scientific goals, uh, managing the community, um, you, you want to do a part uh, science communication because you don't want to just simply extract um, a data. So by definition, it should be an interdisciplinary endeavor. 
um, and given that a lot of these methodological choices that you have to make uh, in a citizen science project are not fully yet uh, explored um, from a scientific viewpoint, um, I think it's necessary to involve uh, a whole interdisciplinary team to at least um, try to make uh, an informed decision on this. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one question came in from Maria from Ma Mapping for Change. She asks, is the lack of participation in citizen science projects related to the fact that we don't really tackle the issues which matter to them, to the participants? And how could we identify those issues before we formulate our projects? Yep. Do you have any thoughts? Um, I can only speak from our experience. Um, uh, so, it is true. I mean, there is there is some truth to that. That um, when you're an academic or a researcher in in uh, a setting in the global north, and and you do research in the global south, that that you always try to you 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 see it from the perspective of your own discipline, and that makes that you that you're um, writing research proposals that that um, uh, that are rooted in your own uh, in your own discipline or in your own understanding of what are the most pressing. Uh, issues and and I think that's that's well observed, uh, not only in citizen science but but in most um, project based uh, research uh, funding schemes. Um, the, the people who write the, the the funding proposal are are those that that take up the direction of the proposal. Um, but I also have the feeling that in that sense there are some things moving. Um, for example, the Flemish um, uh, interuniversity uh, collaboration uh, funds scientific research uh, with the Global South. Um, they are really pushing forward this idea of first doing a matchmaking between universities in the global south and the global north, and then I've identifying the priorities there. Um, and I think that is the way forward um, to identify these research questions or these um, targets for projects very early on, um, uh, together with uh, the universities in the global south, or even um, just uh, have universities or other partners in the global south identify um, issues or priorities and then do a matchmaking um, if needed or if there is an opportunity there with other partners uh, in the global south or the global north uh, to, to uh, elaborate or to design a, uh, a project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very well. Okay, so we have now a bit less than 10 minutes left. Um, I saw some comments also that it's um, your Answers were very much appreciated, especially about the Global South. And uh, so maybe to both of you, a final question. What are for you, within one sentence, <laughs> no, let's say two or three sentences, what are the most um, pressing challenges right now um, for citizen science in regard to the SDGs? And what's your own um, personal favorite action that you would advise citizen science practitioners to do, to um, to be more aware or more related to the SDGs? I don't know, Clea, if you want to uh, <laughs> kick this one off. Sure. Um, so if I understand correctly your question, Fanny, it's, it's more, um, what is the first action that we would tell citizen science practitioners um, if they would want to get involved with the SDGs, what they should do? Yeah, like, or as you see, like right now from your research, what is what are what is the biggest challenge now? Maybe let's say for for citizen science researchers to act for the SDGs or citizen science projects in general, and what what advice would you give to solve this challenge? Um, from what I see, the biggest uh, challenge for citizen science to actually get involved in the SDGs is just basically the recognition of it um, to, to, uh, by, um, to be a relevant practice to get involved into, in, in the SDGs. Um, I think what's already being done and I think what needs to continue being done is more of its um, kind of promotion and its, uh, its talk, but it's just, I, I believe that the initiative already of translating the indicators is very big because it's enabling, it's giving the community or the practice of citizen science and autonomy um, of actually getting involved in the SDGs without 
already the data being recognized or uptaken by uh, a national statistical offices, for example, um, because I don't think the community should really wait um, to get recognized as a method to get involved in the SDGs. Uh, it's, it's already shown that a lot of projects are actually doing something and, and helping towards monitoring uh, the, the environment. Um, so I, I think that is really great. And so I, I would say more um, collaboration perhaps within the citizen science community um, and more uh, getting together and, and making it happen. Thank you. Yeah, I have a um, mm -hmm. very similar um, comments. I think from a from a research perspective, um, I think uh, the most pressing issue or the, the the most interesting maybe to me it would be then to uh, really investigate the um, the discipline itself and develop it um, in a sense that that will we have to. I think we have to. Um, to to really investigate um, what drives participants um, or what hampers participants um, uh, in citizen science projects, um, what the effect of this motivation is on data quality, um, how we communicate these results to policymakers. Um, and these are all, um, I think, also methodological um, questions currently. So that would be, to me, the, the most uh, uh, press pressing uh, issue. And, and then in terms of action, I can only follow the, the recommendation of CLEA, is to, to, to bring people together, um, because um, uh, it is, uh, in some aspects, still a, a young um, a discipline. Uh, to bring people together from different perspectives and and um, share best practices and share research research results uh, on all these topics. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So I think uh, it's time to slowly close the session. And uh, yeah, thank you for your presentations. And uh, I think we saw a lot of different aspects, uh, the complexity also of the relationship between the SDGs and citizen science, the challenges, but also um, the current state of research and maybe possible ways for solutions and, and next steps also. So let's, let's, let's take this session not at the end of the discussion, but as the beginning. And uh, now at the EXA conference, we will have lots of time to share experiences and come together. So thank you very much, Clea and Lise and also Rosie who left already for the presentations and for the discussion. Um, thank you, everyone who joined the conversation and who listened to us and who wrote questions in the chat. It was great, very interesting, very thought provoking. Thank, so, sorry that we couldn't take up everything. But um, yeah, thank you very much for the organizing team as well. And enjoy the rest of the conference. And I hope to see you all around. Yeah. Thank, you thank you very much. much.